If there is one thing we all agree on, that would be digital transformation driven by relentless technology innovation, is literally forcing businesses to continually adapt and change the way they work. The question is, how do you manage this constant churn of change? And, more importantly, how do you do that with limited resources? Through effective change management. So, has this spiked your interest? Welcome everyone. I am Andrew from Invensys Learning. I welcome you all to this session on effective change management. This is a recording of a webinar held by Invensys Learning on effective change management. Let's quickly take a look at the topics that were discussed in the webinar. In this session, first you will learn what exactly is change management and how it creates and adds value to the organization. Secondly, you will learn about the different levels of change management. Then you will gain an understanding of seven R's in change management. Post that, you will learn about change management processes, roles, activities, and interfaces. Lastly, the session concludes by talking about how to measure change. I hope the agenda is clear to you guys. Before we get started, a brief introduction about us. Invensys Learning is a leading training and certification organization providing globally recognized certification courses, such as IDLE, PMP, Prince2, Change Management, Business Analysis, Lean Six Sigma, DevOps, COVID-5, and more. Over 50,000-plus professionals worldwide have been trained and certified by Invensys Learning for some of the leading Fortune 1000 companies globally. We also post blogs, videos, and host webinars on some fascinating topics across various industry verticals. So, follow us on YouTube and other social media platforms to stay regularly updated on our upcoming content. So, coming back to this webinar, it was presented by Victor Foster. He is an accredited ITIL expert and consultant with eight years of training experience from SharePoint and Incident Management Systems. He has experience with technical writing of user guides for various software systems used by the DoD and other government agencies. He has co-authored the Cybersecurity Awareness Training Program Policies and FISMA Compliance and provided support for interagency training sponsored by DoD IG. Without any further ado, let us get started. Uh, thank everyone who's participating. And I also want to thank uh, Invensys, uh, Kaylin, uh, for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Uh, you know, I'm a true ITO advocate. I think sometimes the, the word that is used is uh, evangelist. And so I welcome the opportunity to discuss effective uh, change management with you today. And so um, let's go ahead and just uh, jump into it. So just to kind of talk about the purpose uh, real quickly, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of get out of that uh, change management is just an IT purview type of situation and, and try to uh, convey how effective change management is actually an organizational wide thing and how it can add value to the organization. And, and again, <clears throat> with the objectives being is helping on organizations to understand how by expanding the scope of change management and their perspective of what change management is and what it can actually help you to accomplish, you'll be able to derive greater benefit from the utility that change management offers an organization. And so also to help you understand how you can more effectively leverage the change management process in order to further your uh, organizational objectives. So first we have to start out because I don't want to make any assumptions just to kind of talk, give you an overview of the uh, ITO uh, life cycle. So change management is a process within the service transition phase. And there are actually five phases. And so you have the service strategy phase. And in this phase, this is where you ask yourself, uh, this is called the what phase. This is the phase where you ask yourself, who are my customers? What markets am I serving? Uh, what services do they need? And how do I define value? And this is also where you determine what your goals and objectives are going to be. And then, and based on that, what style of governance do we need to further that? And, and how will this shape our policies? And then you move to the service design stage. And, and this is called the how stage. And the main output of that is the, what's called the service design package. And I won't go into a whole lot of detail about that, but I will say that the service design package is basically, you might think of it as an electronic cabinet or an electronic blueprint that contains all the information to manage the service throughout its entire life cycle from its inception till the service is retired. 
And so service transition, which is where the change management process resides, this is the testing, building, and controlling phase. So this is where you're going to take the information from the service design package, and you're going to use that information, and you're going to ensure that that the service is going to meet the business requirements. So that's how it gets tied back to, you know, the service strategy and the business requirements. And so you'll hear us talk a lot about alignment with the business requirements. And so what ITIL tries to do is to align the IT services so that IT is a partner with the business uh, <clears throat> and to help the business achieve the bit. Uh, so this partnership will help the business achieve their business outcomes and their business objectives. So just to kind of talk a little bit about the different processes that are involved in the service transition phase, you have the transition planning and support phase, which is basically planning for the transition, uh, making sure that uh, you have You've laid out all the activities that the resources are in place and so on. Uh, there's service validation and testing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, of course, uh, before you transition the service into the live environment, you want to test it and make sure that it meets all the business requirements and that you've uh, and that you've met the utility and warranty requirements of the business. And so, just to briefly kind of tell you what utility is. Uh, ITIL says the utility means that the service is fit for purpose. And basically that means what does the customer receive? What does it enable them to do? How can, it, you know, what can they do with the service? And so the warranty side of it is fit for use. And this is where you, you uh, ask yourself, how am I going to deliver the service and how am I going to uh, manage the service? And this is also the side where you ask yourself, what are the, the risks to in the different areas such as availability management, uh, capacity management, uh, IT service continuity management, and also your information security management? And how do I mitigate those risks before the service goes live so that I can ensure that the service is going to meet the business requirements and and you and in order to create value you have to be sure that you have both of those aspects in place and so that's utility and warranty and service validation and testing will help you to ensure that you are delivering that before you transition it into the lab environment so it's more than just testing all the components and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we uh, dive deeper down into it so change evaluation is initiated by uh, the change manager uh, who facilitates the uh, change management process. And basically what change evaluation does is there are at, at different points as you go through the process, it's sort of a uh, go, no go uh, scenario where you decide whether or not you need to do some more work or if you're ready to move to the next phase. Uh, there's release and deployment management, <clears throat> which is once the uh, change management gives the go-ahead, release and deployment management goes into action. And of course, there's uh, change management, which is going to be the main focus of what we're talking about today. And then there's service asset and configuration management. And this is uh, this is a process that works hand in hand with change management, and it uses that information to help it um, manage the configuration items that are going to go into the service. And then, of course, there's knowledge management. And uh, we won't talk a whole lot about knowledge management, but knowledge management is really important in that uh, anytime you introduce a new service or, or you make changes, there's going to be a knowledge transfer that has to go to the various stakeholder groups. And knowledge management will help you to uh, ensure that you deliver the right information to the right audiences in a form, uh, in, a, in a presentation that they'll be able to make the most use of. So another thing I want to point out is that ITIL creates continual feedback loop. And this is really important because what happens is, is that you have a lot of information sharing that's going back and forth. Uh, and so, you know, information. And so we use this information to continually make improvements at the at each stage of the service lifecycle, so that 
so that we're continually sure that the service is in alignment with the business. So for example, a lot of the information that service transition uses is going to actually come from service design. And so again, that brings us back to the service design package, which is going to con contain all the information that we need in order to test, build, and then finally run the service on a day-to-day -day basis in support of the business and the business objectives. And so I just wanted to point that out, that this feedback system is one of the great advantages of ITO that enables it to deliver uh, deliver those services in a way that benefits the business and continually aligns with the uh, business requirements. So just to kind of talk about the definitions, uh, I had a little bit of a, a, a struggle here deciding which there's so many that I could uh, introduce to you and talk to you about. So I said, well, which ones are going to be the most relevant? And I'm sure I probably left out one or two that would have been useful. But I think these will uh, help us focus on the effectiveness uh, aspect of change management. So, of course, we have to define change management. And so basically, change management is a control process that controls the life cycle of all changes. And the main objective is to enable beneficial change with a minimum disruption to IT services. I'm sure we can all remember circumstances where uh, something has been introduced into the lab environment and it didn't deliver the result that we wanted. And occasionally, occasionally there are disruptions and then uh, you know, we have all hands on deck type of situation, which takes away from other activities that we could have been working on. And there's a cost associated with all that. And so one of the things change management seeks to do is to help us uh, increase the percentage of successful changes, which is a, a cost benefit in and of itself. So service change, I chose to call it a service change because I wanted to expand the idea of what we think about when we think about change. But the basic definition is it's an addition, modification, or removal of a authorized plan or supported service or service component, also known as a configuration item, and also it's associated documentation. I just want to stop a minute and kind of talk about documentation and ITO. So the ITO concept of documentation is this documentation is just intent. Records are actually evidence of activities. So in the course of change management, some of the things that change the change manager has to do is they have to uh, maintain what's called a change record. And a change record will record all the details of a change. You know, who raised the change, the status of the change, what configuration items are included, and so on. Um, that brings me to the request for change. And so uh, in a formalized uh, change management system, you're going to have what's called a request for change. And this is a formal proposal for a change to be made. Ideally, when you when you uh, submit a request, raise a uh, request for change, it's going to include a lot of things. And so it should identify the configuration items that are going to be uh, affected. And so this helps uh, the people that are going to be doing the developing, uh, the people that are going to be doing the testing to have a better idea of how the change is going to affect uh, other existing services. Because what we discover a lot of times is in order for change management to be more effective, we need to have a better idea. <clears throat> we need to have a better idea of the relationships between the configuration items within our uh, environment. And so we need to talk about the different types of change. And so a standard change is a pre-authorized change that's low risk, uh, something that we generally do on a routine basis, and it follows a documented work procedure. So what happens is, is that change management will take a look at uh, the various types of change that are going on in the an organization, and it will try to uh, move as many things as possible to uh, the standard change category because not everything needs to go through change management, but it does need to be controlled, and that's the reason for the documented word procedure. So something like, I don't know, um, changing a cartridge in a printer, that's that's actual type of change. But is, does it raise to the level where you need to submit a formal proposal? I don't think so, but we still need to control that, to track it. And so we created this category called standard change in order to do that. 
Uh, emergency change is pretty much self-explanatory, but it still needs to be evaluated, assessed, and either rejected or implemented as quickly as possible. And this is the highest priority of change defined within an organization. And then there's normal change, and, a, and these are the changes that must follow the complete change management process. And so when you submit a request for change, you're talking about a normal change. Now, change proposal, this is a type of high level change. And so a change proposal will typically uh, originate uh, in the service portfolio management process. And it could be the result of a business case. It could also originate in from project management or program management. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's typically a high level uh, description because you're not going to get down into the details until you submit those uh, associated requests for change. So for example, you might have a request to add a new module to an existing SAP. That's going to be, that's going to require a business case. That's a high level change. But however, it would be a great idea to submit this to change management before you charter the change. So the change management can identify potential resource conflicts and assess the risk for you. And so those can be included and considered before you charter that particular type of change. Now change evaluation is a process for managing the risk associated with major changes to reduce the chances of failure. And again, as I mentioned before, this is initiated and controlled by the change manager. So what it does is it gives you a structured way of assessing a change with respect to uh, the likely impact it's gonna have on the business, uh, existing services or proposed services and the change and, and the current and potential uh, future IT infrastructure. <clears throat> Now the change manager, again, he's the facilitator that's uh, responsible for the overall change management process. This person will determine the change schedule. Uh, they will maintain the change records. They will also determine who needs to participate in the change advisory board meetings. They will also set up the agenda for that. So the change manager will be the one that will contact and let everyone know who needs to participate in which uh, change meetings. And so it's circumstance specific. However, there are certain groups, stakeholder groups that should be represented uh, for each change. So uh, you would you would need to have a customer representative. Uh, the service owner should probably be uh, represented. A uh, relevant empowered person from uh, the service operations team should be present. Uh, technical uh, technical, the relevant technical representatives, technical management representatives, the relevant application management representatives, and any third parties that are involved in delivering the service uh, where we're proposing a particular change. So again, it's a circumstance specific advisory committee. It's chaired by the change manager, and they're gonna assess, evaluate, and either approve or reject the change. Now, so you ask yourself, how does this contribute to the effectiveness of change management? Well, it's all in the planning. So what is the value to the business? Well, effective change management will increase, will raise the reliability and will support business continuity. And how does it do that? It does this by minimizing risk to the business. So when we introduce a new service into the, into the environment, we have a much higher uh, confidence, much higher possibility that it's gonna work as we envisioned that it would work. And it can also minimize the impact to change the operation. So it reduces downtime, which is a cost savings in itself. And then on the customer side, you know, it raises the confidence of the customer <clears throat> and it raises the trust level. And so you so you develop that uh, trust relationship with the customer. And over time, as uh, the customer comes to see that uh, they can depend on you to introduce new services, uh, help them with new initiatives uh, on a consistent basis, when there is the occasional failure, it won't be as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It won't be as uh, drastic as it might otherwise be because you've created that relationship of trust. 
Now, reduce fa- you want to reduce failed changes. Uh, so the fewer times you have to rework, the fewer delays you have, the fewer defects you have, uh, this will minimize the adverse impacts on the quality of service. And that's a, and that's a big plus. It also increases staff productivity because uh, you know you reduce downtime. Uh, they're able to do their jobs more efficiently and more quickly. And it also improves project uh, return on investment. <clears throat> and so project managers will be very interested in this uh, because you know cost is always a factor. You have the triple constraints of project management. <clears throat> And project management managers will also need to be able to, you know, coordinate the activities, uh, understand what the, where the handover points are, <clears throat> and you know, so that they can meet those time constraints, uh, the quality constraints, and uh, and of course, uh, costs. <clears throat> and it also uh, helps you to manage risk by improving your risk assessments. So we're able to better identify better identify potential risk and have the contingencies and uh, countermeasures in place that will help us to avoid those service failures, those uh, defects and reworks and defects that we mentioned earlier. Now, when it comes to change authorization, I kind of wanted to talk about this because I think there's a tendency to think that change management just happens uh, in the IT department, but you can actually have different levels of change. And especially if you're interested in ensuring that you're in alignment with the business requirements. And so change authorization can ha- can happen at different levels and it depends on the level of risk and where the request uh, originates. So you have your level one change authority, which is typically the business executive board. And so this is when your concerns, high cost risk, uh, that requires decisions to be made by the executive. <clears throat> now, level two, this is uh, at the IT management board steering group level. And this is when you're talking about where change impacts multiple services or organizational divisions. So that's a different level of change. Another thing I want to mention is in larger organizations where you have, you might even have regional change managers and regional change authorities at these different levels. And this is where uh, a knowledge management system really comes in handy because you want to coordinate that so that everyone is aware of change that's going on in other areas and how it affects the organization as a whole. So you might think of an organization is an interesting word because it derives from the word organism. So something that happens here has an effect on the entire organism. And that's really important to keep in mind. So you, even though you might have cha- uh, regional change managers, you still need to have coordination and communication between the various groups. And this is where a configuration management system comes in handy so, because you have a centralized repository of information about all the relationships uh, of uh, the configuration items in your entire environment. So you can under, have a better understanding of how it's going to, how a change in this area is going to affect the change across the entire organization. And then, of course, at level three, you have the cab or the emergency cab. And this is change which impacts uh, a local or a service group. So again, uh, that dovetails back to what I was saying before, when you talk about you might have regional change. So in each region, you're going to need to have your own cab or, e, or and, and the ECAB, which would be a subset of the cab, which would be empowered to make decisions in the event of emergencies. Now, at level four, that's the change manager. And so the change manager is going to be empowered to make decisions about low risk change. And then you have your local authorities. And so change management is taking a look at this and you have your standard changes. And and another thing I would like to mention about standard change is quite often, depending on the nature of the standard change, this is something that you can move to a service request process and you can let the uh, service desk handle those type of changes. Uh, Like a new laptop, for example, uh, you may have an onboarding process and the human resources submits a request, got some new employees, 
uh, they're going to be in this area. This this employee is going to be in that department, and then the service desk will route those specific requests to the groups that are going to actually uh, <clears throat> issue the laptop, the uh, t telecom service, and so on. So there are different levels of change that can take place, and there are three different levels, basically. So you have your strategic, your tactical, and your operational level. And so your strategic or business changes speak to changes in the business direction. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these would typically originate in service portfolio management. And a change proposal is usually charted as a result of an improved business case. And again, it may also originate in program or project management. So that's strategic uh, at the strategic level. And then you have what are called service or tactical changes, uh, which are typically proactive in nature because we're trying to make a modification that's going to improve a service or expand a service. And so this is refers to modifications to new or existing services and they result from a change in strategic direction. However, not all tactical service changes are connected to a strategic change, but, and, but however, they filter down from uh, changes that need to be made for other reasons. Now, operational changes are driven by technology, uh, security grades, uh, operating system grade upgrades, and, and a lot of times they're implemented as a corrective action, uh, something we need to do to make something better, but they can also flow down to the operational level due to a strategic change requirement. So that takes us back to that change proposal we mentioned earlier. And a change proposal may have multiple requests for change associated with it. So in order to implement that uh, strategic change, it eventually filters down to operational changes we need to make it to align with that strategic change. So this brings us to the uh, seminars of change management. And so this is basically a starting point for assessing and evaluating the impact, risk and benefits of changes. And one of the reasons I wanted to include this is I think this is a question that should be asked. This is a set of questions that should be asked at each one of those levels. And so it's not just uh, the IT department that should be asking about who raised the change. At the strategic level, maybe the question would be formulated a little bit differently, but you'll also want to ask yourself, you know, who raised the change? What is the reason for it? Why do we want to implement this change? And what do we expect to get from the change? What is the benefit? What are we trying to achieve? What is the business outcome? And, and we can ask those questions at the tactical level also. And so if, if we ask those questions at each level, as it flows down, as it flows down, we have a better chance of achieving exactly what we want to change to achieve. So we would ask what the risks are at the strategic level, uh, you know, uh, what the risks are at the tactical level, and also what are the risks are at the operational level? What are the effects it's going to have on existing services, existing configuration items? Is it going to require us to uh, obtain some new people resources or some new infrastructure resources and so on. And then we ask ourselves, and this is gonna be mostly operational, um, <clears throat> who's responsible to build, test and implement the change? So what teams, what groups are gonna be required? What skills do they need to have? Uh, and, and, we, and again, what is the relationship between this change and other changes? We can ask that same question at each level. You know, what is the, you know, what is the relationship at the strategic, from the strategic perspective? What is the relationship, what is the relationship at the tactical perspective? And then of course, you know, at the uh, operational perspective, we're mostly talking about the configuration and how it's gonna affect the existing services. And at the same time, we may also need to think about, uh, you know, propose, how is it gonna affect things that we're proposing to do in the future or things that we've already proposed to do that are in the pipeline, but this has come along. How does it affect things that we've already decided that we were gonna do? 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, change management process. It's, it's really important that everyone understand how the change uh, process works. And there are a lot of roles involved. So depending on the activity, you can have different uh, roles. So you have the change manager, the change practitioner, a change authority. Uh, it depends on your organizational design. <clears throat> and so on this right-hand side, so you see you have your different, here's where the different roles might be involved. Then we have uh, our activities here. And then on the far right, you may notice here in this little bar here, it says update information in the uh, CMS, the configuration management system. And we have these bi-directional arrows at, you know, at each one of these activities. So what this tells me is that there's someone that's gonna be responsible for making updates to the configuration management system at each one of these points. Change management needs to have accurate and current information in order to be effective. This requires a huge culture change uh, there could be a lot of resistance to this in the beginning because we're asking people to do things differently. We're asking people to collaborate in a way that they haven't co collaborated uh, in the past. Uh, it can create a lot of anxiety. But once we've got this uh, system in place and people start to see how it works, then you get that buy-in and, and people will understand why it's important to do change management in a structured way. <clears throat> And, and how it can help them to be more effective in how they do their work. And it can also, uh, you know, improve the relationship between IT and the business and the, the business itself. But anyway, let's talk about, so when it comes to creating the RFC, you have your change initiators. So there are a lot of different uh, people that could be change initiators. This can come from, uh, top management, it can come from a customer, it can even come from a supplier. A supplier might be able to put in a request for request for change based on something that they're changing on their end that's gonna have an effect on your services. <clears throat> uh, maybe a customer call, maybe a customer su submits a request for change and they say, uh, we want to add a, a new column to a database, an Oracle database that we're using. Then you have to record the request for change. So change management is gonna be responsible for uh, recording the request for change. And the request for change, even though it's a separate document, it will become part of the change record. And then you're going to need to review the request for change. Now, this is usually done uh, in the course of a change advisory board meeting. And you're gonna assess and evaluate the change. <clears throat> and decide whether or not to move forward with the change. So you see here, at this point, there's a secondary workflow that's uh, that's indicated. And so this is a change evaluation. And so if the change is rejected, you see that it goes back up to the assess and evaluate. Now, if the change is authorized, you authorize the change in the building of the test, at this point, this is where release and deployment management would get involved because they're gonna be the ones that are gonna build, test, and deploy the change. So there's a close relationship, an interface there, if you will, between change management and release and deployment management. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, momentarily. <clears throat> so then you move on to the coordinating the change and the build and test. <clears throat> And then the next step is to authorize the change deployment. And then the change deployment has to be coordinated and there are different types of deployment and we'll speak to those momentarily. And you see here where it says scheduled, we have to schedule the deployment and then it, uh, it's implemented. And you see there's a workflow associated with that. And finally, we review and close the change record. So here we're gonna talk about the uh, different roles, activities, and interfaces. <clears throat> so transition planning and support does the planning. It's gonna coordinate the overall approach to managing uh, transitions. And I also want to mention here that transition planning and support will be responsible for determining your release policy. So what type of naming convention are you gonna use? Uh, how are you gonna schedule releases? How are you gonna group releases? 
uh, and, and, and other aspects of that as well. Now, business change management must coordinate with change management in order to under impacts to IT service components. So this is something that I think is neglected in a lot of organizations, or oh, we have a change management process. Business change management needs, I, I would argue that business also needs to have a business change management group or a group of people that are coordinate with change management anytime there's a change management initiative so they can understand how it impacts the infrastructure and have a better idea <clears throat> and have a better idea of whether or not new resources are going to be needed and, and, and how the uh, infrastructure is going to be affected. Now, program or project management need to work in partnerships so they can align the processes and the people involved in the service change initiatives. So we're talking about things like, you know, do we have a test manager? Uh, how do we coordinate testing? Who's going to manage the baselines? And after we've made a change and it's been it, it has been moved into the lab environment and service operations has signed off on it, who's going to create the next baseline and ensure that uh, as uh, additional subsequent ch changes are being made, that we're actually operating from what the environment looks like right now today, the current environment. Um, <clears throat> and then there's organizational and stakeholder change management. In some organiza organizations, this is separate. In other, in other organizations, it's a part of change management. But we need to consider the organizational aspects of change. Uh, and we need to talk to the teams that are going to be carrying out that work. So, for example, we're making a new change. Is it going to require uh, different stakeholder groups to do things differently or to work differently? Is it going to change the workflow? Are we going to be changing our sourcing and our, are we going to have new partners? So all of these things need to be taken into consideration so that we have a holistic uh, top level, 30,000 feet understanding of how the change affects the organization as a whole. And so sourcing and partnering, these are subject to change management practices and principles. And sourcing is really about procurement. What do we get our, uh, you know, we get a lot of our, we get a lot of our resources from partners. And so we need to think about that in terms of change management. Now service asset and configuration management, this is really, really important. It's going to provide us reliable, quick, and easy access to accurate configuration information that will enable stakeholders and staff to access, assess the impact of proposed changes. And so what service asset configure and configuration management does is it manages the information within the configuration management system. So let's say, for example, we put in a request for change, and I'm not sure what type of uh, systems you guys may use, but one that I'm familiar with is ServiceNow. So let's say you use a ServiceNow and you've enabled uh, the discovery tool and you and you have a service asset and configuration management process in place. So someone puts in a request for change. Using this discovery tool uh, as part of our request for change, we can, we can see which configuration items are going to be affected. And then we can do some modeling and have a better idea of how this change is going to affect the live environment. And that will help us to mitigate potential problem areas uh, and put in countermeasures or make modifications so that, so that when we move it to the live environment, we have less likelihood that it's going to have an adverse impact or we're going to have a delay or it's going to result in defects or we're going to have to do some reworking which requires us to put all hands on deck to fix to fix the issue and in the meantime other activities are being neglected and so there's a cost effect that's uh, associated with all that So one thing I always like to point out is, is change management is the authority. Basically, if you say you're going to do change management, what you're actually saying is, is that I'm going to do service asset and configuration management, which I'm going to use to manage the configuration management system. <clears throat> so again, the purpose of change management is to control the life cycle of all changes so that you can enable beneficial change with minimum disruption. Change management leverages the configuration management 
uh, system as a tool to track the life cycle of configuration items. Service asset and configuration management could be said to be the admitted as aspect of change management. And so these activities include management and planning. So before we do this, we need to have a plan in place. And I'll admit that this is for some organizations, if you don't have an existing communication, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> CMS, it's gonna be a huge undertaking. Uh, we have to think about configuration identification. So what, what classes are we going to use? What naming conventions are we going to use? What types are we going to have? Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, there's hardware, there's software. And we even within those categories, we have, to, you know, productivity software, enterprise software, and so on. <clears throat> and then other things we have to ask ourselves is what level of information do we need to capture? And depending on what type of config, the class of the configuration item, uh, that will be that will help us to understand how much information we need to capture about a configuration item in order to manage it. So that means for some classes, we need to capture uh, different levels of detail. <clears throat> and for other classes, in order to manage that effectively, we're going to uh, capture fewer levels of detail. But configuration identification will help us to do that. And so in the beginning, uh, we have to we have to determine what our ID system is going to be because every configuration item needs to have a unique ID. Uh, we actually need to determine uh, who owns the configuration items, who's going to have the responsibility, who controls those configuration items. And so we're not just talking about software, we're also talking about hardware as well. Uh, how do we track them? Uh, where are the configuration items? And different things like that. And so this can provide us with uh, useful information as we're going through the change management process to give us a better idea of how this is going to, what effect this is going to have uh, when we move it into the lab environment. And then that goes back to the testing uh, environment that I, I was uh, talking about uh, earlier. <clears throat> and then there's configuration control. So we need to have mechanisms in place to ensure that up-to-date information is captured so logical and physical information match. Now, a lot of this we may be able to automate, which is really, really great. And, 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 and then again, going back to what we mentioned earlier, talking about the different types of change, uh, strategic, tactical, operational, uh, you need to have a time frame for when these things uh, need to be recorded within your configuration management system, because you want your configuration management information to be as up to date as possible, because your change management <clears throat> is only as effective as the information that's available for it to leverage. Now, when it comes to uh, status accounting and reporting, these these are things like you know tracking uh, some items need to be tracked in real time because they're stat well they all need to be tracked in real time more or less but sometimes we need the status of different configuration items uh change and we need to track that uh with other configuration items we need to capture the baseline so we can have an idea whether something is operating within the normal parameters or not and other things that we can do with status accounting and reporting uh, from the financial side for really significant configuration items, it could be that financial reporting does uh, depreciation on those type of items. And so we can use our configuration management system to run reports and provide that information to the people that need it on the financial side. Uh, another thing is we need to track the life cycle of configuration items. Uh, and then that way we can run reports and we can provide information again uh, to the to the right people uh, and identify configuration items that are nearing the end of their life cycle and may need to be replaced in the next fiscal year. So those are other ways where we can practice effective change, change management through this process. And then of course, there's verification and audit uh, from time to time on a, well, and it probably needs to be on a schedule. We want to confirm that our uh, information, check that our information and our configuration management system is as up to date and current as possible. 
So I mentioned release and deployment management earlier. And again, this is considered to be the operational side of change management. So change management approves the change, release and deployment management are gonna do the building, testing and deploying. And so again, if you refer back to that process flow chart that we saw er earlier, RDM is initiated when change management approves a change. And it goes through four basic phases. So you, you're gonna have release and deployment planning, uh, then it moves to release, build, and test, uh, deployment, transfer, retirement, and then you review and close. And in parentheses, I have PIR that stands for post implementation review. So at the end of every change, once it's been closed, which means that we moved it into the production environment, <clears throat> you need to do a post implementation review and ask yourself basically a lessons learned. Uh, what did we do right? Uh, were we on budget? Uh, did we do it within the right, within the time frames that uh, we predicted? And uh, other questions as well. One thing I do want to point out is that there's a period in between uh, this kind of, they kind of start in between deployment, re review and close, and before it actually uh, service operation signs off on it, where the uh, release and deployment management teams will be providing an additional level of support to service operation to ensure that you might think of it as a testing period to ensure that the service is going to operate as designed and as envisioned and it's going to deliver the benefits that uh, we agreed to deliver with the customer when we gathered the requirements. <clears throat> So one thing that happens, you may notice here, or I have a line here that says change management will use entry and exit criteria for each uh, phase as a type of quality check. Well, these are actually called quality gates. And so what happens is the change management has to give release and deployment management the authorization to move from one phase to another. So first they have to meet the entry criteria to start that phase. And before they can exit the exit that phase, they need to meet the exit criteria. And so these are quality gates. And it's also at each of these different points that change evaluation also gets involved. I also wanted to point out uh, in the third step, the deployment step, there are different types of deployment. A transfer is considered a type of deployment. So even if we're outsourcing a service, let's say, for example, we decide to uh, outsource the service desk. So we're going to have a third party do the service desk. That's still a type of deployment. And so we still need to go through, that still needs to go through the release and deployment management process and all the attendant processes that uh, interface with, with it as well. <clears throat> So change evaluation and assessment, this is initiated by change management again. And as you're going through your service transition, um, it has basically four sub processes. And so you can see that these correspond uh, more or less to the release and deployment management process. So you're gonna do evaluation prior to the planning. <clears throat> and you're gonna do evaluation prior to the build, you know, the build and test. You're going to do evaluation prior to the deployment, and you're also going to do a uh, post-deployment evaluation. And so, again, change evaluation is going to serve as a decision point on whether to move forward to the next phase. So it can even be a go, no go in the sense you, you can make a decision whether to continue or to abandon a change. So it could be that you... Uh, you say, well, okay, we need to go back. And so you go back, but there could be a scenario whereby you do decide that we're gonna abandon this until some future time. And so change evaluation will help you to make that determination. Another thing that change evaluation and how it provides benefit and value is that it will help you to be confident that as you move through those phases, that you've met the requirements and that you're gonna get the end result uh, that's expected by the customer once it gets into the lab environment. So there's measuring change. <clears throat> so 
So in order to achieve effective change management, you need to have critical success factors. And so a critical success factor is basically something that has to happen in order for a process or a service to be successful. And so what these do is they help you to understand the whys of change management, but more importantly, they help you to understand what you should be measuring and why you should be measuring it. So there are a lot of things we should be measuring, but we should ask our, we should ask the question, why are we measuring it? Who's using the information? And what's the benefit of using the information? But some of the questions when, as it pertains to change management is that critical success factors can help you answer are, why even do change management? What are the customer's needs? And what is it that we're trying to achieve by undertaking change management? And then going a little further, you might ask yourself, when it comes to changes, what is what do our customers complain about the most? So what are we doing wrong or what could we do better? Are we meeting quality and time requirements? And how do we measure that? How do we measure whether or not we're meeting quality or time requirements? We can do that by uh, attaching a critical success factor to that. And this will also help us answer the question, do we have the capabilities to meet future business initiatives? Now, when it comes to critical success factors, they need to be succinct and expressed in easy to understand language. So for example, you know, one critical success factor is we want to reduce the negative impact of change. That's how we add value. We want to increase the number and the rate of successful change. That enhances our effectiveness. And we want to consistently and effectively implement change in a way that reduces risk to the organization. And so that's why we need to base critical success factors on what is important to the business. And so this will help us focus on what is important. So for example, let's say the service desk, what would be a critical success factor for the service desk? So the service desk might say, well, a critical success factor would be to reduce uh, SLA breaches by, I don't know, 20%. So you start with your baseline. What are our SLA breaches at present? And then you can take that and you can, and so you have your critical success factor. And then based on that, you can create a key performance indicator. Now, what we need to understand about key performance indicators is that they're composed of metrics and measurements. Now, your measurements are your individual data points. And the metric is the calculation you make on those, in, on those uh, individual data points. So you can take the number of breaches over time. You can divide that by the total number and you come up with a reduct, you come up with a number that tells you whether or not you're achieving your critical success factor. And so all services need to have a critical, well, actually the rule of thumb is two to five critical success factors. Now, depending on the service, you may have more. Uh, with other services, you may have fewer. But the important thing is, is that you need to base those on what's important to the business. So there are a lot of things that we can measure, but the important thing is, is we need to know why we are measuring it. Well, um, One of the things I wanted to do as I was going through this is I wanted to be sure not to delve too, delve too much on the IT-centric side of discussing change management. But however, it was still necessary to drill down to some of those aspects in order to demonstrate how it links back to the strategy and to tie the value add to it. So it's really important that all the actors and stakeholders in the organization understand the part they play in making change as effective as possible throughout the entire organization. So what we tried to do in order to demonstrate that is to show the diverse, the, the various touch points. Now, when you implement IT change management, you're really implementing a type of organizational change management in that it touches all areas of the organization. And so effective change management is understanding how change management flows downward 
from the strategic all the way down to the operational, your business requirements, and, and back upwards. So ideally, you should be able to, so speaking about critical success factors again. So how it works is every organization has a vision. And so this is really kind of the where the business sees itself going. And then the mission is in is the what we're currently doing in support of that. And so based on our mission, we're going to have goals and objectives. And the way we determine whether or not we're meeting our objectives is we're going to have critical success factors. And we're going to have critical success factors at each level. Those critical success factors are going to be composed of those KPIs. Uh, you know, you have your individual data points, you have your metrics, which are the calculations you make on those individual data points. And so you should be able to tie those uh, KPIs all the way back up to the organizational vision. How does that tie in? How does that express uh, the vision of the organization? So it's a process that enables the constant alignment and realignment of services to continually meet uh, your business outcomes. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, change management. Uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to manage uh, stakeholder involvement. And so this might involve even persuading stakeholders why they should even be involved. Uh, you, you need to properly assign roles or responsibilities. And you want to balance control and bureaucracy. So change management is about control, but you don't want to, you don't want it to stifle change. <clears throat> so you, you need to be able to find a, a balance that allows you to control the changes while at the same time uh, you know, providing that benefit that change management offers. So you have to establish a culture of change. And so it has to come from the top, you know, and, you know, if the top is not uh, on board, then, you know, further down, further down the chain, people are going to be aware of that. So, you know, it comes from the top. Uh, as an example of that, I can remember when I was doing that cybersecurity awareness training initiative at the FCC, and they were, tr uh, they were undergoing a, a FISMA audit. Uh, one of the problems they had had in prior years is they didn't have the buy-in from the top. And so that's really important when it comes to establishing a culture of change. You also, we didn't really go into a lot of this as we were going through the, uh, the uh, webinar today, because I didn't want to get, uh, you know, too granular with uh, all the different activities within the different processes. But when it comes to change management, you, you have to do re, re, remediation planning. And so what we mean is, is you need to have a, you need to have contingency plans in place. We can do all our due diligence. We can do everything correctly. And unfortunately, sometimes unforeseen consequences will occur. So we need to have a backup plan in place, a back out plan, or other contingencies in place, uh, just in case the change fails or the change doesn't provide the results that we thought it was going to provide. And then again, going back to what we were talking about uh, just earlier, we need to know what to measure <clears throat> and understand why we're measuring it. Another thing when it comes to change management is managing multiple simultaneous changes. Now with, you know, with most organizations, we have multiple things going on um, more or less simultaneously at the same time. It's, we can't, it's not a linear, it's not a linear process. We need to be able to do multiple things that we need to be able to multitask as it were. <clears throat> and that can be a challenge depending on uh, the size of the organization. <clears throat> And the pace of change, that's that's something that uh, I failed to mention. We also need to think about the pace of change within the organization. Something else that's really important uh, is updating documentation to align with the processes. Again, your processes are only a, as effective and efficient as the uh, information that you have available. 
The same thing is true for change management, which is which is why it's so important to have a second process in place uh, to keep the information current and up to date. And that also reminds me uh, something that I would like to mention. Another challenge that I didn't list here is, you know, we need to manage the maturity of our processes. What happens quite often is, is we have processes that are in close alignment or connected closely together. For example, change management, release and deployment management, uh, service asset and configuration management. These processes are the moving parts of a larger larger mechanism, if you will. And if those processes are at a different maturity levels, we may not be realizing uh, we may not be realizing the benefits and efficiencies that, that we could be. And so th those are other areas where we want to seek to make improvements to improve our change management process and make it more effective. And then of course, uh, there's the challenge of managing multiple teams. Hope you guys found the session interesting. If you are interested to pursue your career in change management, Invensys Learning can help. At Invensys Learning, we offer instructor-led live online change certification training, which is designed for working professionals. Change management is set to transform the business world. Get certified today and stand out from the rest of the crowd. For more updates on trending technologies, subscribe to Invensys Learning YouTube channel. Also, if you have any queries, Share them with us in the comments section.